here at Truth Baptist Church. It's a pleasure and a joy for us to have you tonight. Thank you for joining in and tuning in with us. Uh, we had a wonderful morning service this morning, and uh, if you are joining now, if you wouldn't mind liking, loving, sharing this uh, live stream, that would be a great help and a blessing to us. Uh, maybe if some of you are watching right now, maybe you could let us know that you hear everything loud and clear. Uh, that'll help Trent to know that things sound well and that we look good. I hope so. Uh, typically on these evening services, we've been all right. And uh, so I pray and trust that everything is going well and that you're hearing us okay. Uh, again, the service this morning was a, a great blessing. And it just seems like each week we're continuing to see more people back and it is encouraging to see the church uh, continuing to reassemble. And uh, we are spaced just perfectly here, six feet apart, uh, every other row. Uh, we've utilized our lobby, and it has been an encouraging thing to see God's people coming back. I know there's some who are still waiting, and, and we understand that. Uh, we are looking forward to having you come when you will be here and when you're ready. And uh, it'll be a blessing to have you back again, as well as the rest of our church fully uh, when we're able to get back to full capacity again. Uh, if we continue to fill up in here, we may go to two services. We're not there yet. I don't believe we'll have to do that here in the next week or two. But if we continue on through the summer and we're mandated still at 50% uh, seating capacity, we will consider that. Tonight, I am continuing part two of a message that I began this morning that I've entitled Love Defined. Love defined. I've got to tell you, I've received a lot of feedback about this morning's message. Uh, I, I don't say this in any way to uh, draw attention in a positive way to myself, but a lot of positive feedback about this morning's message. Thank you for that. Uh, I would encourage you, if you didn't get a chance to listen to this morning's message, I hope that you would. Uh, I mentioned some things that are happening in our world right now, especially in our country and in cities across our country and I hope that you'll take a moment to listen to that if you do. Uh, tonight, I'm continuing on in Love Defined Part 2. And we're picking up right where we left off. This morning's message was 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. Uh, this evening's message uh, picks up in verse 5. And we are looking at love, that is, Christ-like love, charity as we see it in the Word of God, defined. Christ-like love is the highest form of love there is. There's no greater love than the love that Christ has for us. We call it charity. Uh, in the Greek, it's the word agape or agapao. Uh, it is selfless, self-sacrificing, unconditional love. And we need, as God's people, to uh, exemplify that same love. And so tonight, we're going to continue on in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Trent, I trust we're sounding good and doing okay back there. Everything looked good. Give me a thumbs up if we're uh, doing well. Okay, great. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. There the Bible says, continuing now about what charity is, it doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in, the in, in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And then I'll read the first phrase to begin verse 8. Charity never faileth. Let's pray together. Lord, I ask that you would help us now as we look into your word. I pray that we would understand true love, love as it is defined in your word. I ask that we could uh, understand it and that we would grow in it, help us to demonstrate it in a very real way to all those that we come in contact with. I pray that we would start first and foremost in our relationship with you. Help us to seek day by day to love you in the same way that you've loved us. And then I ask that that Christ-like love would be... Uh, shown in our homes, to our spouses and to our children, and then to our church family as well as our world. I ask that we could love like you do. Help us with that. Help us to understand the message tonight and to grow from it. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray, amen. 
We learned that charity this morning, agape love, is the greatest and purest form of love that exists. It's that type of love that a parent has for their child. Uh, the one that a husband is commanded to have for his wife. It is best exemplified in the person of the Lord Jesus who willingly laid down his life and became our sacrifice on the cross, not because he had to, but because he loved us and desired to. It's unconditional, it is wholesome, and it is evidenced in the willingness to give everything that we have, even our very life itself, for somebody else, for their betterment. It is the love that we as followers of Jesus Christ are to be striving for and emulating every day. We learned this morning that charity suffers long, it's kind, it envies not, and neither does it vaunt itself because it is not puffed up. Let's break down the rest of the phrases as we see them this evening, beginning in verse 5. We see first and foremost that it behaveth not itself unseemly. What does it mean to behave unseemly? Here in our text, the word literally means unbecoming or rude. Love, charity as we see it defined in God's word, is the exact opposite of rude. Uh, we as God's people, if we are to have the mind of Christ and if we are to have the testimony of Christ, will not conduct ourselves in a rude way. Remember, as I mentioned this morning, sometimes we're more polite to strangers that we come in contact with than we are the ones that we're closest to. Uh, if we are going to love, we must not conduct ourselves in a rude way, whether it be our family, our closest friends, or even our co-workers or fellow believers. It's the exact opposite of what agape love is all about. True love doesn't have a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde switch that is flipped back and forth while everyone around us is expected to adjust. You ever know someone like that? Have you ever conducted yourself like that? Uh, maybe we all have our seasons of life that are more difficult than others, and I'm not saying that we should be perfect all of the time because we're not. But some people, it seems like they're up and down to such a degree that you don't know what kind of person you're going to get next. They're never steady. Uh, they're never consistent in their behavior to the degree that you can know what to expect from them or how to conduct yourselves with them. Maybe you're seemingly walking on eggshells or on thin ice around them because you just don't know what you're going to get. I think we've all experienced that. Maybe we've even unfortunately demonstrated it. Let's work against that because that's unbecoming. It's a rude existence. Uh, I've known plenty of people who were beautiful on the exterior. I've known people who were stunning in their physical appearance. But after getting to know them and who they are and the way that they conduct themselves, you ever realize that they weren't quite as good looking as you at first thought? At the, by the same token, I, I've gotten to know people who, you know, you, didn't, you weren't really struck with their appearance first and foremost, but after getting to learn of who they were and how they loved the Lord and how they loved others, they became so beautiful. We ought to always remember that how we appear on the outside is just the outer shell. It's just the, one, the initial thing that man gives attention to. But who we inherently are, inwardly will be demonstrated day by day and we ought to be becoming beautiful not just in our appearance and by the way we should do all we can to make our appearance as good as we can I, i'm not against uh, personal grooming and trying to strive for a, a a nice physical appearance but remember uh, love demonstrated in the heart of a believer can become a truly beautiful thing Charity doesn't behave itself unseemly. It applies also in our relationship with the Lord. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Are we fellowshipping with God? Are we growing to the Lord? We have emphasized here in recent days and weeks the importance of assembling back together 
as the church. But I want to ask this question. More than just assembling together as we are beginning to do and we look forward to others doing, let me ask you this question. Are you assembling with the Lord each day? Are you coming into His presence each and every day? That's at the heart of the Christian life. I want to encourage you. Uh, today is May 31st. Tomorrow is June 1st. Monday, June 1st. Why don't, why don't you start tomorrow? You can start by reading Proverbs chapter 1. And, uh, and there's about 30, there's 31 chapters in Proverbs. You can read a chapter every day. Uh, do something, however, just to seek God and go to His Word and learn truth and, and walk with Him and seek that day-by-day -day relationship. Secondly, we see that charity seeketh not her own. In other words, you're not just consumed with your own affairs and all that pertains to you all of the time. Now, I understand we have to look after our own business and we have a responsibility to look after uh, our responsibilities and our household and, and all that uh, we uh, are uh, given. However, the Bible says that we are to look beyond just those things and to get out of our bubble and get out of our our lane sometimes, not to interrupt somebody else, not to throw someone else off course, but to help them in their race. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4, to look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I'm not preaching tonight that we become nosy and we nose ourselves into everyone's business and become a busybody, but what we ought to do is make ourselves freely available to as many people as we can, not to find out anything about people per se, but to help people. It means that we actually take an interest in someone else's life besides just our own. But a person who possesses charity is doing that. They're not just looking for old number one. They're not just trying to take care of themselves all the time. I think all of us would agree that occasionally we'll come across someone who's just consumed with themselves, consumed with their own needs, consumed with their own wants in life. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and it seemed like you couldn't get a word in edgewise? Now, some people are just talkers, and they have to be reminded to let the other person talk every once in a while. And it's not that they're an unloving or non-charitable person. They just love to talk, okay? So not every talker is being rude and unloving. But there are some folks that just seems like all they are consumed with is themselves, and all they want to talk about is themselves. And uh, they don't want to really have the conversation, and they're not interested if the topic of the conversation doesn't revolve around them or their family or their children or what's important to them. Uh, that, that's the opposite of charity. Charity doesn't just seek her own. We need to remember that. There was a time not all that long ago in our own country, where the very President of the United States of America instructed her citizens to ask not what their country could do for them, but rather what they could do for their country. What a concept. To actually seek to make a difference. I think part of the reason we're seeing such wicked behavior in rioting and looting and burning down buildings today and as it continues on day after day, it's because of entitled behavior. A society that says it's about me and what are you going to do for me? And I believe a lot of what we're seeing today goes beyond protesting the death of George Floyd. Now we ought to protest, I think, in times where it's appropriate to protest, but a protest is far different far different than rioting and burning and looting and all that goes with it. God, help us. This is what we're instructed to do. Not just be consumed with ourselves and what we can get, but to have compassion. Jude chapter 1 and verse 22 says, And of some have compassion, making a difference. This is only possible when we're looking out for others. This is only possible when we're looking beyond ourselves and beyond what we believe uh, is important. We can only truly make a difference as we see people where they are. 
and put ourselves in their shoes for just a moment. I would say we all have our own filter. We all see life through our own perspective. It would behoove us to observe people in our world and for just a moment, for just a moment, put yourself in their situation. Now, in one breath, I can preach against the rioters and the looters, but in the next breath, I'll say this. I don't know the homes they grew up in. I don't know if they had a mom and dad in the house. I don't know all of their background. And for a moment, maybe, maybe for a moment, we could put ourselves in someone else's situation. I'm not excusing sin. I'm not excusing wicked behavior. But I believe that we can have greater compassion if we will envision ourselves in someone else's place. Maybe you've been blessed, shepherd. We ought to see people like Jesus does. When you look upon the multitudes, don't look with disgust. Someone might say, but look what they're doing. I understand. We live in a in a, in a defunct society. We live in a broken down culture. We ought to see them as sheep that are scattered without a shepherd. It's why we need to give the answer, and the answer is the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ loves them as much as He loves us. He gave His life for them as much as He did for us. He loves everyone, for God so loved the world. And so have compassion. That's what God has called us to have. We'll reap a harvest, we'll replace an emphasis. Emphasize compassion, and you will experience compassion. Emphasize something other than that, and that's what you'll experience as well. Thirdly, it is not easily provoked. The word for provoke is paroxuno. It means to sharpen alongside. The imagery is of a blade or another object or instrument that is being grinded, cut, shaved. Uh, maybe some of you who've started to cut your grass now that we're into the late spring and into the summer, you know what you have to do occasionally is get that lawnmower blade cut if you want it to cut the grass effectively. And that's the idea of sharpening something, of grinding something to a very sharp, edge. Now listen, this is one of the only times you're going to hear me say this, especially in a message. You need to be dull. And I need to be dull. What I mean by that is we must not be provoked to where we are sharpened to an edge where we are on, are on such an edge that we're easily angered or provoked at the slightest little thing. Listen, if we have charity, it will be very difficult for us to be provoked, to react in the flesh, and to become angry if we live with charity. We won't be easily provoked. On, on December 9th, 1977, during an NBA game between the Lakers and the Houston Rockets, a scuffle broke out between several players at midcourt, and Kermit Washington was at the center of it. Rudy, Rudy Tomjanovic ran to midcourt in an attempt to break up the fight. What happened next will go down as one of the worst scenes in all of sports history. Kermit Washington landed a, a roundhouse punch full force to Rudy's jaw, causing him to fall and to break several fo facial bones as well as his jaw. He was never quite the same after that. However, afterwards, he had a right spirit, both Kermit and Rudy, they, they came together and they, they forgave and they moved past that situation. Uh, I, I wonder if, if Rudy had had a different approach, if he had been maybe just a little different in how he responded to that, if it could have been not only an ugly scene on the court, but an ugly scene that played out for years afterwards. The Bible goes on to describe charity as thinketh no evil. This means that if we live with charity, we won't presuppose the worst about people. If we possess genuine charity, then we'll believe the best about people and be willing to continually give the benefit of the doubt to people. 
I got news for you. I'm not the greatest at this. Sometimes I can be just the opposite. Those who know me well know that I can be a real skeptic. <laughs> I don't believe much of what I see or hear. I, I can be a cynic by nature. I don't always believe what I'm presented with, especially if it's really great news. I just want to investigate further because I have a hard time believing it. And my natural tendency is to question even the intentions of others and doubt that they might mean well in what they're doing. Now, I'm not like this all the time, but I can be. And that's, that's wrong. It's wrong for us to presuppose the worst. Listen, here, here's the way that we can begin to live with genuine charity. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Take everything at face value. Be wise. I think there uh, is a great benefit in living with wisdom and not just biting the hook of everything that's presented to you. However... Although we might be astute and wise financially and in a business sense and in other ways, when it comes to people, let's always give folks the benefit of the doubt. Let's determine that we are going to think no evil. This is one of the reasons why I believe the Lord gave me my wife. Her natural disp disposition is to be more positive, to believe the best about people. <laughs> Uh, and I believe she does pretty well at that. We all need to believe the best. Uh, have a loving nature towards folks. Determined to be positive. Let's model that and show it to others. That's what real charity is all about. Again, Matthew 9, 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted or scattered abroad as... A sheep having no shepherd. We might talk about changing our world and trying to see people one to the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, but until we see them with compassion and decide not to always think evil and the worst of everyone, it will help us. The Bible goes on to tell us in verse 6, Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. We ought to shun evil and we ought to stand against sin and iniquity at every possible turn. When we see wickedness around us, we need to call it out. And we ought to call it out equally. Whether it's racism, whether it's rioting, whether it's just pure hatred. Listen, call sin what it is and call it out equally. Because iniquity is not to be rejoiced in. I don't know if this is a true report or not, but I hear of some celebrities that are actually donating bail money to those who right now are being arrested after tearing down our cities. We ought not to ever rejoice in iniquity. Don't stand and cheer on those who are involved in sin and wickedness. It ought to grieve our heart. The Bible tells us that fools make a mock at sin. It's not funny. There's nothing funny about it. There's nothing joyful about it. And God forgive the ones who are on the sideline egging it on, uh, who are monetizing it, those who are supporting it financially or in any other way that they can, God forgive them because they're just as guilty. Charity thinks no evil. Charity rejoices not in iniquity, but in the truth. We rejoice in the truth. We want the truth to be stated. We want the truth to be given. Listen, more and more in these days in which we live, we're hearing very little, if any, truth. Much of what we hear presented to us through media sources and other outlets, quite honestly, cannot be trusted. It's honestly not truthful in many ways. There is so much that is just false. It's not correct. 
Uh, we can't just turn on the nightly news or 60 Minutes or other programs like we used to in years gone by and say, I can take that for what's being presented. There is so much that is, is a front, and it's not accurate, and it's false. We need to rejoice not in that which is false, but that which is true. Here's what I know to be true. The Word of God is true. The Lord is true. My salvation, my relationship with God is very real and very true. And in a time and in a day where I can't put my faith or my trust in much at all, I can put my faith and trust in the truth. I'm glad that I have the truth. We need it. We need to hold to it. We need to freely give it and share it and speak those things which become sound doctrine, to know them and share them with a world that so desperately needs it. Verse 7, beareth all things. That's kind of the idea of forbearing. We're, we're enduring it. Believeth all things. That goes along with what I just spoke about. Thinking positively rather than negatively about people. Hopeth all things. Do you live with hope? Do you have hope in your heart? Listen, we need hope, don't we? We need to live with hope in these days. I'm considering Wednesday nights, maybe if not Wednesday nights, here in another one of our, our preaching times, preaching a series on hope and just going through hope in God's Word. We need hope and we need something we can hang our hat on. We need something to look forward to. And by the way, we have much to look forward to as God's people. But we need hope for today and hope for tomorrow. We need that blessed hope presented before us over and over again. And if we live with charity, we won't be a downtrodden, uh, negative, negative Nelly all the time, but we will be a hopeful, positive, encouraging person. Endureth all things. We just have to hang in and endure. Hang in and endure. When you're at the end of your rope, I've heard that you're supposed to tie a knot and hang on. Maybe that's what we need to do. But endure. Don't give up. Don't throw your hands up and say, what's the use? Don't say there's no point. Listen, uh, don't, don't say, what's the point in me saying this or doing that or trying to make a difference? Make the difference. Make the phone call. Be the encourager. Share the track. Call the widow. Reach out to that person of a different ethnicity than you and and learn of them and talk to them and form a bond and a relationship with them. Share Jesus with anyone and everyone that you possibly can. Endure. Why? Because we see in verse 8, charity never faileth. Now, if we read on, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. We have the, the completed word of God. We have the scripture. And in it we see a love letter from God to his people. Someone once said that the word of God is an account uh, of man's quest for the Lord. That's not it at all. The Word of God, Scripture, is an account of God's quest for man and redeeming him. And redemption is seen all throughout this Bible. And time and time again, in every book, we see the Lord Jesus showing charity, showing love to this world, to his people. I've got great news tonight. God loves you. God loves those who are not doing what they ought to be doing. God loves every sinner. God loves those who are wreaking havoc. God loves those who are rioting. God loves those who quite honestly have done some wicked, terrible things in this life. God loves everyone. And he loves me and in my 
depravity. And he loves you and your depravity. The Apostle Paul we look to sometimes as a man who was almost on a pedestal to the degree where we consider him almost like deity. But remember what Paul said about himself. He said, I am the chief of sinners. He said, O oh, wretched man that I am. And if Paul spoke that way, we, we can all speak that way. We all must be continually reminded of how good God is and how depraved we are and how we have presented freely to us His love, His free grace, that if we by faith will accept and receive, can change our heart, can change our life, it will make us a new person, we'll have a home in heaven and a relationship with the King of kings and Lord of Lords, forever and ever and ever. Let's live with charity because our world needs it. Let's live with charity because our home needs it. Let's live with charity because our church needs it. Let's live with charity because we need it. May God help us to remember that every single day. Thank you for tuning in tonight. I want to let you know I love you and I mean it when I say that. I'm glad that you've tuned in. I hope that you've shared this video. If you want to go share this morning's video as well on, on our Facebook page, I encourage you to do that. Uh, these two messages I preach, I put a lot of consideration into, and I've asked God to help me. And I hope it will make some kind of a difference. Now listen, let's do our best to make a difference this week. Let's show the love of the Lord to everyone that we can. Let's live with charity. And ask God to help us with that. I hope that you'll tune in Tuesday at 9. I'm going to have truth time. I think that's what I'm going to call it. Tuesday truth time at 9 on Tuesday morning. I hope you'll tune in for that. I'll either be at my house or in my office. And we have a busy week this week. A lot that we need to try to get accomplished. Wednesday night, we will be back. We met for our first Wednesday night this past Wednesday night. We had a great meeting together. And uh, thank you for being here. I want to encourage you to be here again this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Listen, things are really, uh, they're very simple right now. So let me encourage you, uh, bring your, ch your children. There's no nursery. We can't, we just, right now we can't have nursery. We can't have children's classes, but it is really a family time. Uh, there's little ones in the lobby with their parents. There's babies and toddlers. Uh, there's children sitting with their parents. Parents, it's really old-fashioned, and I kind of love it, you know. And we'll get back to junior church and children's classes and nursery as soon as we can be past the social distancing and all that. But I am really enjoying just the, the old-fashioned come, be a family, hear the Word of God, sing a few a cappella songs afterwards, and we go home, and we try to live our Christianity. I, you know, I, I know the Lord did that on purpose in my life because I needed that. I needed things simplified. And, and they've become simplified. The calendar is clear. We're just having church. We're trying to live with grace and compassion and share Jesus with as many people as possible. Listen, you have a wonderful rest of the evening. Enjoy the beautiful night. And uh, we'll look forward to being back together at the appointed time.